The uh, <clears throat> first time I met our speaker for today, uh, <clears throat> David Franks, was when he called me uh, on the electric telephone uh, in the 1990s and uh, asked if I would uh, participate in uh, one of his books uh, entitled Mind, Brain, and Society Toward a Neurosociology of Emotion. And of course, uh, I wanted to do it. And then uh, about a year or so later, uh, at an a ASA conference in Chicago, I had the opportunity to uh, meet David uh, on a face-to-face -face basis. And it was a great opportunity because most of the time when I go to ASA conferences, they're kind of daunting for me, and I end up in uh, dark parts of, parts of bars uh, and so forth. Uh, but what David did for me is uh, take me to a party. He said, come on, Stan, let's go to a party. So we went to a party, and uh, party there were a lot. He's a real party guy, and he's a charismatic kind of guy, you know, and he knows everybody. And I don't think it's just because uh, he's an older gentleman, uh, and he's had a lot of time to get to know people. It's because of his uh, charismatic personality. He uh, knows a lot of people, and that's a great opportunity for people like me uh, to meet people. So that was a good party. Uh, <clears throat> after that, uh, we, uh, uh, I didn't see him very much after that, but then he gave me another opportunity with uh, Will Kalkoff to publish in another one of his books. So he has lots of books and lots of articles. And uh, as to his uh, academic uh, background, he has a deep uh, southern roots, uh, and he does have a slight accent uh, as a result of that. He knows about cheesy grits and things like that, don't you? Cheesy grits? You've heard of them. Not cheesy. <laughs> he uh, graduated uh, <clears throat> first from, uh, <laughs> from Millsaps College in Jackson, Mississippi. He got his uh, MS at Mississippi State and Tulane. He taught at uh, parochial colleges in New Orleans uh, <clears throat> and worked uh, as a street worker with delinquent gangs in Chicago for a period of time. Uh, he taught a year at Mankato State College in Minnesota. And then uh, <clears throat> he entered the uh, PhD program at the University of Minnesota uh, and uh, specialized in social, uh, sociological organization and social psych. Uh, <clears throat> he uh, then took a uh, tenure track job after getting his PhD at the University of Denver. Uh, he was there for uh, nine years and then he got the opportunity to be chair in 1977 uh, at Virginia Commonwealth University where he uh, eventually retired uh, in 2001, I think it was, something like that. 99. Oh, 99. Okay, uh, 99. You were in the okay. first book. In Neurosociology. And neurosociology, right. Yeah, that's right. His article, by the way, if you mind me for interrupting you, had nothing to do with the book. <laughs> <laughs> it, the book was supposed to be about emotions, but I thought it was just so fantastic that he could predict all these campaigns. And well, I'm supposed to be doing this introduction. Okay. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Uh, he's published recently a book in 2010 entitled Neurosociology, the Nexus Between Neuroscience and Social Psychology. Uh, <clears throat> this book uh, really has had uh, excellent reviews and it merges uh, neurology and the discipline of sociology, uh, which is, uh, and also it's a, it's a well needed, very, very much needed polemic, essentially, to convince uh, sociologists that this subdiscipline is really critical uh, for the future of our discipline. Uh, let me just quote uh, very briefly from his book. Uh, David quotes uh, Leslie Brothers on page 39, and I just want to read this quote because it does give you an indication of, the, uh, of his orientation and the book itself. While our individual brains are singular and self-contained, the processes on which they depend for functioning are social ones. We have seen that there is no fully working human brain without the presences of other brains. The functioning brain is social in the sense that any given brain is completely dependent on other brains for its development. Without question, the synaptic brain is contained in our individual skulls, but the intangible thought processes 
which these synapses make possible depend on a social environment with other actors who are engaged in everyday public discourse and interaction. Uh, and so that kind of gives you an introduction to some extent to the uh, content of this book. Okay, um, David has spent a lot of time obviously in his academic career in publishing books and articles and teaching and so forth. But one of the really interesting things about him is that he is an aircraft pilot and he has flown diverse types of aircraft including Navy Corsair, Japanese planes, British planes, French planes, and the rest. Um, just makes a real interesting character. And uh, I've got to say, though, that um, the planes that he has uh, piloted are, the wingspan is a little smaller than uh, most airplanes. It's kind of like this, quite like this. But nonetheless, uh, it takes a lot of skill to do that. And he's uh, excelled in that as well. So I'd like to present to you <coughs> Dr. David Franks. I'm glad you stopped when you did. <laughs> there you go. I'm innocent. There you go. Not too often I can say that. Okay, so, well, first I want to ask. How many of you do not know about an old philosopher named George Herbert Mead? Is he familiar to everybody in here, pretty much? Okay. Um, well, then I don't have much to say about that, <laughs> <laughs> except for one thing, and that is that, uh, well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my field it started out as symbolic interaction and I got my degree at Minnesota and there were some uh, very well-known uh, professors there that were into symbolic interaction and uh, that was supposed to be the field that uh, George Herbert Mead made possible. It was uh, changed a little and in the hands of uh, Herbert Bloomer, it lost a little bit of its emphasis on motor behavior and uh, how important uh, just motor getting around in the world was to our, our brains. But um, a friend of mine told me that George had come to the University of Chicago, called there by the great John Dewey, and he was called there to take care of the neuroscience uh, lab and um, working with human brains. Uh, Dr. Gallagher just told me that um, he caught something on fire, left a candle uh, uh, lit when he shouldn't have, right, and uh, caused a fire in there. And maybe that's why he only was uh, head of the lab for two years, I do not know. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to find out from Tim all I can about that because my field symbolic interaction just totally forgot about me and became kind of uh, the spokespeople for postmodernism. And, uh, you know, they, like they would say, everything is in discourse. There's nothing outside of discourse. That is social construction, which is the heart of sociology for sure. But that is social construction gone awry. Like uh, you're going to be able to talk yourself into diving from a, a 200 foot rock into the water and you can do that any way you want. Uh, no, there's something that's left out of that, which is action and motor behavior. And uh, that's what these guys were really um, focused on. So symbolic interaction lost that and just became interested in language per se. And I wrote a book with a friend of mine called Sociology in the Real World 
and it was trying to take that to task, that there was something called deed. And words are deeds, there's no question of that. Uh, Audrey, will you marry me was a big deed. So I go back home and we have our 53rd anniversary because we kept that more than words, much more than words. I mean, as I think of it, don't, I have to stop myself, stop David. But, um, you know, just, it's just ludicrous, I think. And um, then I was criticized because uh, nobody cared about uh, the uh, postmodernism anymore anyway. But, um, so I've been rocked around a little. Uh, we had a meet the author session in Texas, me and my colleague. Uh, nobody came showing that nobody was interested in the real world anymore. But, um, but the reviews were good, and uh, it was uh, really nice to work with him. So, uh, so much then about George Herbert Mead, which you know about anyway. And uh, I've entitled this New Thoughts on Agency and Bits of Neurosociology. Um, something in me wants to say new thoughts on agency and um, insane bits of neurosociology, but actually uh, Stan picked out the one part of my book that uh, I would have selected to start on, which was uh, my friend Leslie Brothers. So I'll tell you a little bit about her as we go along too. So first of all, to explain my title. Since many of you have read my book, I wanted to include more than what I had already written, and one thing morphed into another until there was a lot new, and only a hint was left on the original abstract I sent Professor Kalkoff. Hopefully in this version I've balanced things out a little. As the title suggests, a lot of what was new was about agency and the notion of free will. The brain science of this capacity is worth our attention for several reasons. Many sociologists think that neuroscience obliterates individual will and reduces the conscious person to their t t t deterministic body parts. Thus, determinism and reductionism imply each other. This determinism and reductionism, um, reductionism has to do with reducing the person to body parts and making the person epiphenomena. And uh, for some reason or another, uh, sociologists are convinced that neuroscience does this. Um, Damasio has a wonderful uh, phrase where he says, I am not being a reductionist. And he goes on to talk about the social and how we always have to keep that in mind. But um, this is often discussed in a terribly dense manner, uh, agency. If you want to really get into dense stuff, uh, read Danette on uh, uh, agency. Um, I've forgotten his first name. Somebody knows in here, but um, he's a, a philosopher that uh, kind of took over uh, neuroscience as his expertise. So at any rate, uh, it's, it's discussed, as I said, in a very dense manner. And yet responsibility implies free will, and both are critical to our legal process, and when you think about it, our sense of self and self-esteem. In my judgment, and I hope you'll agree, it's infinitely putting our minds to. At first, I'd start to talk about sociology's interactional basic unit of analysis, which was supposed to set the boundaries of sociology and to differentiate it from other disciplines. But cognitive psychology's social neuroscience, in the hands of people like Cassiapo and Bernstein, often uses this unit of analysis also. In my lust for something new, I started reading Gazanaga's nine, uh, 19, uh, 2012 volume, Who's in Charge? And not only did I find agency again, but I also found that he too had stolen our unit of analysis. To make things worse, so did another neuroscientist, uh, a hero of mine, a heroine of mine, I should say, Leslie Brothers, 